Hi, welcome to Ascend TV, Life on the Autism Spectrum. I'm sitting in today for Keith Halperin. My name is David Platzer, and I'm a PhD candidate in anthropology at Johns Hopkins. And I'm Will Burnick. And Will, you're going to tell us a little bit about your shirt. This episode shirt is 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 another USF shirt. I I I've been going. I got it from a USF basketball game. I represent. I. I've I've been going to I go to their games all the time. I they they've been doing they've had a great season. I'm going to another game tonight there to watch them play against Santa Clara. They've had a great season. That's great. That's great. Well, thanks for sharing, Will. And now we're going to turn it over to Stacy Kennedy, who's our cultural report correspondent. Hello. Today I want to um I want to share something really exciting. Ascend um, was up was nominated for the best education and instruction at this um, awards ceremony, which um, happened Friday evening, February third, at the Great Star Theater in Chinatown, and um, Life on the Autism Spectrum won, and. Um, we will be getting a plaque in about a few weeks. You know, this is the temporary one. But it's, um, I just wanted to share the news that the certificate presented recognizes the show and on the SF Commons Channel 29 in the year 2016. So this is Ascend's um, a trophy for, um, for our show. So there's that. And thank you very much. Hi, Will. So now do you want to start us off with our questions for our illustrious guest, Jill Escher, the SFA Autism Society. Gladly. What is, what is, what is the Autism Society? Well, Autism Society San Francisco Bay Area is a nonprofit that has actually been around for about 50 years. Uh, it was formed shortly after the Autism Society of America was created in 1965. It is an affiliate of the Autism Society of America, which is based on the East Coast in Maryland, but we are one of about 100 independent affiliates uh, that serve our local communities. Um, and our affiliates do it in different ways. Here in the San Francisco Bay Area, we're really focused on um, educating people about autism, helping network and support autism families, and helping advocate for policy. What is what is your background in the autism field? Good question. Uh, I did not uh, come into the autism field, I have to admit, by choice. Uh, I have three kids and two of them, one of whom was just here, uh, are autistic. Uh, they're both nonverbal. They're on the more severe end of the spectrum. Um, and I knew almost nothing about autism before. I had hardly even heard of autism before my son, who's now just about 18, was diagnosed. So now I have a son who's about 18, I have a daughter who's 10, and um, I was kind of thrown into the field. I, as, as your dad knows, I, I, I'd been a lawyer before that um, and, and enjoyed that, but now really devote most of my time uh, to autism, having really immersed myself in the subject and the need for advocacy and the need for support for the community. What is your role as president of the Autism Society? Uh, so our Autism Society is an all volunteer run organization. We have 16 people on the board and I've been the president now for about three and a half years, I think, almost four years. Um, you know, my role is we're all volunteer is we just head up lots and lots of projects and I'll, I'll talk about them. I brought some slides to show you to illustrate what we do. Uh, we spend a lot of time creating um, educational content for our community. That means a really strong website. It means a monthly newsletter. It means a really strong blog. It means lots of events, including a really popular annual conference. Um, and we also do a lot of advocacy work as well. So I tend to be at the head of all of those different efforts that our board all participates in. Well, Jill, you've mentioned a few of the events that you guys have put together. Mm -hmm. uh, 
maybe tell us a little bit more about the conferences, the webinar series, the upcoming dance-a-thon, the kinds of things that uh, the Autism Society does. All right. Um, so, yeah, we're a pretty busy group. Let me tell you a little bit about um, what we've done in the past. Three years ago, we started an annual conference really focused on adult autism. Um, not that we don't care about kids. Obviously, I have kids. We care a lot. But there was a real need among our families to learn more about options for adults. So our conferences, uh, which sell out every year, they've been getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, this last year, it was at Stanford University. Um, really focus on um, adult issues. One year we did housing, another year we did you know, uh, something focused on programs and supports locally. And this last year we focused on planning, so long-term planning for adults with autism, which involves a lot of uh, things that are too detailed to go into right now. So what's coming up in 2017? Well, we're adding something new this year. We're really exciting. We're starting a webinar series. Um, and this is a way to reach a lot more people at very, very low cost and bring experts in from around the country, not just focus on people here. So we just announced five webinars that are going on this spring, and we're going to announce probably about three more pretty soon. And who's the first speaker? The first speaker is Michael Burnick. Who, who is? <laughs> who is the father of Will Burnick. Mm -hmm. And who will be talking about a subject that people are really super interested in, which is employment for adults on this on the spectrum. So he is our premier, and um, then that's followed by uh, a, a gentleman from Pennsylvania who's going to be talking about um, uh, relationships and sexuality. Uh, we have uh, Susan Senator from uh, Massachusetts talking about her book Adult Autism, which just came out last year. Uh, we have Amy Letts, who's a mother of a very, very severely affected boy, who will be talking about um, a, a type of therapy that's controversial, uh, but really helped her son. Uh, and then we have uh, the re some researchers from UCSF. And then we have um, a, a whole, oh, and, and I want Ascend, actually. We're going to have to talk about this on this webinar. Um, in, I think it's in April or early May, it'll be a webinar entirely devoted to social programs for adults on the spectrum in the Bay Area. So we definitely want you guys as part of that webinar. Um, that'll be a panel webinar. And then we have a few more coming up. Um, so uh, we're really excited about the webinar series. And uh, we will have another conference this year, December 2nd, also at Stanford. And do you know what the theme of that's going to be? We're working on it right now. Um, it's not going to be too terribly different from last year. People really liked the conference last year and really asked us to do more of that. So, but it'll be a little different. I have a slightly different spin and, and slightly different speakers. So um, we're excited about that. Uh, that's all day Saturday. Um, and what else? In the near term, we have our first fundraiser. And it's the dance-a-thon. And there's a big typo because I called it a dance-a-thin on, on this. And I'm like, I wish it was a dance-a-thin. Is, is it a typo or is it the objective of the, dance -a -thin. the event? <laughs> well, that, I, I think we get a lot of attendance yeah. if that's the uh, yeah. objective. But the dance-a-thon, we, we've never done anything like this before. But um, what we're doing is we're partnering with a number of other autism-serving nonprofits. So there are eight of us. It's the first multi-beneficiary autism fundraiser that we know of in the Bay Area. And we're hoping to raise money for all of us, not just Autism Society San Francisco Bay Area. Our other nonprofits uh, are all involved in the recreation field. So they provide camping, they provide dance classes, they provide horse therapy. They're, they're things that are more recreational in nature. Next year we might do something different. And so our goal is to have 400 dancers on this giant dance floor in Palo Alto it's called Cubberly uh, Pavilion. Um, it's reputed to be the biggest dance floor in the Bay Area, 12,000 12, square feet. We have a DJ and lights, you know, disco lights, and everybody is going to, like a walkathon, you know, ask their friends to sponsor them. Um, uh, for the dance-a-thon. And, and so people who are interested in getting involved, what does it entail? Uh, well, uh, you so you register for free. You go to our website, sfautismsociety.org. There's a link to the registration. And once you register, uh, it's just like a walkathon. You ask your family, your friends, your coworkers, people on the street, you know, to sponsor you. And you raise, we're asking for a minimum of $125 a dancer, which sounds like a lot, but you have two months to do it. And basically, if you ask five people for 20 bucks, that's all you really need to do. 
And so it's not that much. And um, then you show up and for four hours, you boogie. And then people who actually dance the full four hours get a prize. And will there be a dance a thon champion? We are hoping so. We are working on that right now. And are um, you preparing to, to be the champion? Or uh, <laughs> my dancing skills, I'm a little over the hill that way. Okay. But D David, we're counting on you. Okay, well. Will, we're counting on you. Do you like to dance? Yes. Okay, I've well then it. you should come. I think it'll be really, really fun. <laughs> and great. it's also, it's in Autism Awareness Week. It's a way yeah. of building awareness and engagement yeah. with the community around autism and really celebrating our families, celebrating our people, um, and uh, you know, bring more attention to Excellent. us. So, Jill, let's mm -hmm. talk about the uh, explosion of autism diagnosis in the state of California. Yeah, this is a really interesting um, and difficult time, I think, for the autism community. Mm -hmm. um, what we saw in the 80s and 90s, in the first part of the 21st century, was this growth in autism in children. And now those children are aging out of school and becoming adults. Children with autism become adult, aut adults with autism with very rare exception. And they will need support and care for the rest of their lives. So you said rare exception now, just flag yeah. that. What, what do you mean by that? Well, I, there's, I, there's some research that shows that somewhere between 7 and 13% of children diagnosed with autism uh, end up with, uh, without autism or with another diagnosis, mm -hmm. such as ADHD. Um, and, uh, but by and large, the vast majority, despite all the best interventions, um, the vast majority of children with autism do become adults with autism. Um, and there's been a, a sort of sea change, I think, in the autism community over the past several years where we're kind of like, oh my gosh, you know, this is a lifespan issue. I mean, Ascend knows this more than anyone. You guys have been serving adults for a long time. And you know it's a lifespan issue, and you know that the lifespan support issue is not resolved in any way, shape, so or form. So let's, let's granularize lifespan issues. If we were to okay. choose the top four, what would they be? <laughs> All right. Well, um, you know, one of them is definitely employment, um, because um, you know a, a lot of adults with autism don't possess the regular competitive employment skills that are expected in standard employment. Right, they might not interview well. Some of them might not, frankly, have skills or have you know the ability to attend to a task because of you know severe cognitive issues. Um, some of them might lack the people skills that you know most employers would expect. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. um, if you're serving food, they expect the waiters to have eye contact right. and engage you and mm -hmm. um, have rapport. So what you know, in so many respects the adult autism population is facing very significant challenges. With employment. employment. No, matter, no matter what level of autism they have. And without going too much into detail, can you mm -hmm. give us a sense of some of the solutions that are being proposed or some of the things that are Watch out there? Watch the webinar with Michael Vernick. Okay. Yes. That's, a plug, that's a plug from Michael Vernick and, uh, yeah. and a prompt to the next question. So, so next next topic then, is it? Uh, so uh, another one is housing. Okay. Uh, we've spent mm -hmm. a lot of time arguing that we need a radical expansion of housing options for adults with autism. Every adult with autism is a unique individual and with unique needs. And um, what one common denominator, though, is that by and large, um, they don't possess the income to buy their own homes or rent their own homes, especially here in the Bay Area. Where are we in San Francisco? How much do you think one of these, you know, one or two bedroom apartments here in the Mission costs per month? We're talking, you know, three, four thousand dollars. That is completely out of line with uh, these adults. Most of our adults are on social security where they're maybe making $900 a month, right? And if you're supposed to spend one third of your income on housing, that's $300 a month. $300 a month won't get you a kitchen sink in San Francisco or even elsewhere in the Bay Area down the peninsula, even in San Jose where I live. So um, we, uh, you know, the great news is we've deinstitutionalized. We're no longer institutionalizing, you know, people with autism, and that's fantastic news. And we'll come back to that later. Okay. And the bad news is we really don't have a good plan B. Mm -hmm. Tell yeah. our viewers who might not know what that magic 300 number means. That magic 300 numbers was from, uh, I talked about the Social Security check. So mm -hmm. if you are an adult with autism on Social Security, you're making about $900 a month in income. You're supposedly under federal law 
to pay about one third of that on housing. That's three hundred dollars a month. Which goes so a long way in the Bay Area. Yeah, that goes a real far long way. So my tenants end up paying me three hundred dollars a month, but the balance in rent is carried by governmental sources. So it's a really wonderful way to really include people with autism in the community in just inclusive, standard, generic settings, um, but have it be affordable to them. So, but the problem is there aren't enough of these Section 8 programs to go around. They're very, very few compared to the demand. So um, I'm interested in seeing that program really expand to meet the needs of the people with developmental disabilities. So maybe without going to the same mm -hmm. level of detail, just flag for us two or three other issues beyond employment and housing that... Um... Okay, one other quick thing oh, that's sure, exciting with housing is that well, another thing we're seeing in the Bay Area is families really banding together to come up with solutions for their kids. Not necessarily Section 8 solutions like mine, um, but kind of group solutions. And there are some in Fremont, in Santa Cruz, uh, up in Sonoma County. Uh, there's one in Half Moon Bay. There are different... Um, I don't know what to call them. Uh, they're not really necessarily intentional communities, but they're kind of micro communities that are really exciting and really necessary uh, to, to serve parts of the population. So that's another exciting thing that's going on. The problem is it's very expensive to do that, so that's a limitation. So we have, I talked about housing, I talked about employment. Um, you know, what's another thing? Um, well, we have... Um, you know, I think a crisis in terms of, uh, you know, those who can't be employed, I guess we'll call it day programs for, I don't, people use different terms for it. What's the term you're most comfortable with? Day programs, probably. So not all people, not at all adults with autism can engage in competitive employment. We know that. That's incontrovertible. Um, and there is a lot of pressure on these nonprofits that supply day programs, um, you know, uh, to, you know, their, their costs have been very, very constrained while demand is going up. Again, more and more and more and more and more of these kids are aging out of the school system and in need of these services. So we're not seeing the supply keep up with demand in terms of day programs. And that comes from uh, really severe constraints on funding. Um, these programs can't find staff. They can't afford uh, locations. Um, you know, they have more and more intensively disabled people who need higher staff ratios or higher types of care, um, and they're just not getting the support they need. So we've seen a number of programs struggle or go out of business um, because of these constraints, and that's a huge problem because now people are aging out of school and the parents can't really find appropriate placements for them. So, yeah, it's a lot. I mean, we're kind of getting it from all angles. And I guess mm. the fourth one I would mention has to do with sort of long-term health and medical care. Yeah. That we have a, a medical community that is just not used to seeing adults with autism. They just mm. didn't exist before. And they, they, there, there are very, very few physicians that feel comfortable mm. or are trained in, in uh, addressing the, the long-term health care needs of adults with autism. So we and, see that as well. And the term itself is a little clinical, but what are some of the comorbidities and maybe you can explain what that term means that come yeah, up in terms of lifespan. I'm not an expert on the comorbidity issue. If you, We have on our website a presentation by Lisa Crowen, who is an excellent researcher with Kaiser, and she published a paper recently on her study of comorbidities in adults with autism in the Kaiser population. She spoke at our conference. And just what does comorbidity mean again? What is comorbidity? It means other health stuff, <laughs> right, <laughs> that may go along with uh, your diagnosis of autism. Maybe not because of the autism, but may also exist and kind of complicate, yeah. right, the clinical picture of any individual with autism. And um, things that, you know, Lisa talked about and, and other researchers talk about um, are things like mental health issues, um, gastrointestinal issues, um, immune problems, um, what else? Sometimes the things are a direct consequence of the autism. There, there can be some self-injury um, and, mm -hmm. you know, physical issues like that um, that, you know, derive from the underlying diagnosis. So um, I would definitely defer everybody watch Lisa Crowen on our website. Uh, she gave an excellent talk on it. Pause. So I have a question for you, Jill. Um, could you tell us um, what priorities and advocacy um, do you see happening in 2017? 
Yeah, well, for Autism Society San Francisco Bay Area, uh, we've been really interested uh -huh. in really raising awareness about the rising numbers. Mm -hmm. There is, unfortunately, a persistent myth that mm -hmm. um, what we're seeing in autism is just a lot of diagnostic shift, or maybe we're counting better, or it's greater awareness, and that these numbers are kind of an illusion or a delusion, and mm -hmm. we don't really, you know, have a, we have, we have a problem here in ascertainment, not a problem in the actual increase in the numbers of people with the condition. Mm -hmm. Well, I, there's, there's really no doubt at all that we've seen a dramatic surge mm -hmm in autism um, over the past about 25 years. And um, we're trying to fight this myth uh, that uh, unfortunately has um, grown a little bit stronger over, mm -hmm. over the years. Mm -hmm. And we, we try to fight this myth using the California data. And I, I brought a slide that shows just two examples of, of the number from the Department of Developmental mm -hmm. Services. And um, you can see autism cases by birth year have grown almost exponentially um, from beginning with births in the early 1980s. There used to be about 200 cases a year of autism throughout the state. Now we're at about 5,000 cases a year. If you go back to the early 80s, there were about 2,000 cases in the system, in the DDS system of autism, and now we're at, we've exceeded 90,000. Mm -hmm. And within about a year and a half, we'll probably be at 100,000 cases of more severe type of autism. Mm -hmm. And that is an incredibly dramatic, and I hate to say it, but dire picture. Yeah. And it's really important that all the lawmakers understand what's really going on. Yes. There have been study after yeah. study looking at this data. And yes, some of it is attributable to what they call diagnostic shift, where maybe mm. someone used to be in a different category, but now we call them autistic instead. But that Jill, can you give us just one example of what, what such a shift is? Yeah, be? so um, there used to be a category called mental retardation. Now it's called intellectual disability. And there, there's some suggestion that some of those cases uh, with that label now are called autistic. Uh, you know, um, there's also, you know, a, a long time ago it used to be called childhood schizophrenia sometimes instead of autism. But uh, the fact of the matter is that people with this level of disability were always in the system. It's not like we're just making this up. Right, they uh, that this shift that we're seeing only a portion of it, um, maybe at most a third, from what I can tell by reading all the literature, and that's at most can be attributable to those factors. So this this climb in autism is real, and it has huge social implications for us, mm -hmm. not just for the schools as we just talked about, right? Because right. the kids with autism grow up to become adults with autism. So these have this has huge societal in implications, and we feel like the entire community should know. We feel that this, you know, we're getting close to 100,000 cases of more severe autism in the state. This doesn't even count, you know, the people with Asperger's and who don't qualify yeah. for our developmental mm -hmm. services system. Mm -hmm. That's probably double the number. Mm -hmm. You know, people should know that number. That should be front page news. That's yes. headline news, and you never see it. So mm -hmm. we really try to, to educate sure. people about the reality of the numbers, especially here in our state. Mm -hmm. Now, another thing is um, we feel that it's imperative since you know, these adults with autism will really rely throughout their lifespan mm -hmm. on a network of nonprofits, really mission-driven nonprofits mm -hmm. throughout the communities, you know, to serve them, whether it's housing, day programs, employment, health, all the things we just talked about. Um, it's imperative to really empower those nonprofits as a really strong network so that these people can remain in the community and be supported throughout their lives. And that the parents can die in peace, right? I, as I said, we're all temporary. Yeah. We're going to go. Yeah. Uh, so who's going to rise up in their place? It's going to be these mission-driven mm -hmm. um, nonprofits. And we have done precious little, almost nothing, to strengthen this network. Mm -hmm. we're, we're really, and we need to reform policy at the federal level and at the state level yes. to ensure that network is strong and in place. So that's another real important area of advocacy. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I thought you had a, a question, too. Last question. Tell us about autism as a spectrum. Well, I think that's a great question, and it's a really hot, hot topic um, in research and in advocacy now. Um, you know, when autism was first defined, it was sort of binary, right? You either have autism or you don't have autism, right? It was a kind of a unitary condition. And then it became a spectrum, kind of you think of it sort of like a, a two-dimensional or one-dimensional spectrum. Um, and... Uh, you know, from sort of less severe to more severe. And now what we really see in the literature is a movement towards a more matrix uh, type conception of autism. And so I, I brought a slide 
that I think kind of summarizes some of the emerging thinking um, in, in the research field. So this is a kind of a two-dimensional matrix, which you can see, where kind of in the upper left corner, you have sort of a normal, what's called kind of a socio-adaptive functioning. And, and what does socio-adaptive mean? Well, it, it, that's kind of my term that I kind of made up based on the literature. <laughs> so it kind of conflates the idea of um, adaptive skills. And adaptive skills are life skills, like, you know, can you... Um, uh, make your own food, you know, can you take care of your own bank account? Can you hold down your own job? Can you, uh, you know, tend to your own hygiene and medical needs? Um, can you engage in, you know, relationships? Can you communicate uh, in a relatively normal manner? Um, and then on the other axis is a little more traditional. It's that kind of IQ slash academic functioning, which sometimes is very different from the socio adaptive functioning. So, um, what you see in this matrix is something that really maps much better to reality than either the on-off autism or, you know, the, the linear type of autism. And in fact, I think we could add probably more dimensions to this, you know, relating to comorbidities, which we talked about before, um, and, or, or other aspects as well. Um, you know, dysregulation, mm. you know, sensory issues. I think a lot of these, these things can be fed into this. Well, I think we could talk about this for a whole Forever. nother session. We could session talk about this for an hour. <laughs> or one, but just, just to piggyback on that and add one last question. Mm -hmm. One piece of your advocacy you haven't mentioned is the smarter science piece. So mm -hmm. how, mm -hmm. how does this sort of matrix of, of conditions relate to the advocacy work you do in terms of developing better scientific research. Right. Well, David, more than anyone, knows about my absolute passion for scientific research. I think a lot of people know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know a little bit. You know a lot. David. Well, everyone knows that. Yeah. Well, I think scientific, a lot of people aren't very keen about autism research and causation research. They, they see it as all natural, and I think there's definitely that in there. We definitely have people with natural forms of autism, no doubt about it. I definitely do not think that all autism has a natural root. And what so do you mean by natural? Natural means sort of, you know, kind of genetic, it kind of, our, you know, my grandpa had it, my uncle had it, now I have it. You know, a kind of a natural genetic condition. Um, there's actually not a lot of research that suggests that, there, that that's happening. We don't see autism being be, uh, transmitted ancestrally. Um, but uh, I'm really interested in causation. And... Um, I, I promote and I support and I fund research that looks at um, different ways that autism may be uh, transmitted, um, but without it being what we call Mendelian genetic. Um, and it, this, to explain it, uh, would take an hour. <laughs> if, um, not, if not a little bit more. If not a little bit more. It's incredibly complex work. Um, you know, the, the good news is that I work with an array of researchers around the world who are doing, you know, fantastic pilot projects looking at new ideas about what might be behind this um, this rise in autism. So, yeah, if you want to invite me back for another hour, I think I can talk about it, but <laughs> it's too complicated. Yeah. Well, great. Jill, just to wrap up, um, are there any other materials that people could access mm -hmm. who want to understand the topics we've been talking about? Sure. Well, our website is sfautismsociety.org, and it is replete with information. Um, we have uh, listings of events uh, all around the Bay Area, not just our events, but all kinds of events. And maybe you can tell us the address? sfautismsociety.org. Pretty easy. And even though we're SF, we serve the entire Bay Area. So we're, just to make clear, we're not just San Francisco. Um, I don't even live in San Francisco. Oh, I love it here. Um, and uh, we have um, a huge amount of resources, page after page after page of resources for autism families. Um, you know, everything from um, uh, camps to programs for high-functioning adults to um, diagnostic services, um, to day programs, so much is in there, it's packed. We have a blog that's incredibly active and really, really popular, addressing all kinds of subjects, um, and a newsletter that comes out. So sign up for a newsletter, it's free, it comes out every month with lots and lots of information. And the last question, uh, for people who want to get involved, how can they get involved? Our email is on our website, info at sfautismsociety.org. So just email us and uh, let us know how you want to get involved. We are a volunteer organization, and we love people who want to come work with us. Well, from all of us at Life on the Autism Spectrum, we thank you for joining us. Again, I'm David Platzer. I'm Will Burnick. 
I'm Jill Escher. I'm Stacey Kennedy. And we'll look forward to seeing you really soon.